All right, we're doing this. The little red light's on, and you're listening. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown, and if it's your first time here, let me welcome you. Everybody else, what's going on? (laughs) You might hear it sounds a little different. My sound might be a little different this week. I'm not at home. I'm in my father-in-law's workshop in Virginia. Long-time listeners know I come up here every now and again. We're here for one last weekend with them before school's supposed to start. And if you were here last week, you know I was talking about that. I was talking about my kids and decisions we're having to make about their schooling. Well, it's gotten even more complicated. I didn't think that would be possible. But basically... They put a new option on the table, you see. As I mentioned last week, we had two choices. You could either do a hybrid where your kids are in school two days a week and then they do three days remotely with their teachers. Or you could choose to do a full cyber academy, which was really not with those teachers. It was like a whole other educational online curriculum. And we were really leaning towards, oh, yeah, they're going to go to school. And their friends were like all the parents that we were in contact with, that our daughters are friends with, they were all on the same page. We were all on the same page together. But then they announced like yesterday a new option where you could do full remote with the teachers, not the cyber academy. So you could still be essentially, I guess, in some way taking class alongside in-person kids. I don't know if they're doing it in real time. I don't know. They can't tell us what it exactly looks like. But you see, all the parents all the parents changed their mind. <laughs> like the whole group of parents decided, okay, well, we're gonna keep them at home. I think everybody's just totally freaked out and scared because they're reading the news about the case rates going up and the second surge happening and and nobody knows what it's gonna look like. You see, I was at first when I heard it, I was like, Oh man, we're gonna especially my younger daughter, they're going to have the the young kids from like K through five, they're going to have them go regular school, but they're going to be distanced. They're going to be masks all day. There's no like interacting with the other kids at centers. There's no, there's no group. They are going to be by themselves kind of six feet away from, they're going to, you know what I mean? I started thinking about that and I was like, wait a second. I want my kid to go to school because she's five and, you know, it's kindergarten. And I think it's like a really crucial moment. I remember when my first daughter went and I was thinking she needs to go to school. But then I was thinking, wait a second, what is her experience going to be when she goes to school? And then, you know, we are in a position where we can keep her at home. And I'm thinking, well, why am I not choosing to do everything I possibly can to ensure that my daughter's safe. Like, I think it would be okay for her to go to school based on what I know. Like, if you look at the infection rates for where I live, it's what everybody said would be okay for us to go back to school. So that's why we're going back to school. But I guess nationally, and because it's so different in so many different places, and because the virus seems so unpredictable, I think everybody's just full of fear, and nobody knows what to do, and And so now I'm thinking, wow, wait a second. If I decide to send my daughter back to school and she ends up contracting it and dying, God forbid, like, I I know that's a crazy thing to say, but okay, wait, but let's just say hypothetically that happens. Am I going to be okay with that decision? Why wouldn't I decide to do everything I possibly can to protect my children? And how privileged am I that I even have the choice? I heard it said, if you can afford to keep your kid at home, you should, because then it leaves more room for the, the kids whose parents can't. But that actually doesn't seem right. It seems to me like I'm privileged enough to keep my kid at home safer. I don't know. I just, it's all like the moral dilemma and the whole emotional reality of it. It's quite overwhelming. 
And we were supposed to decide within the next couple of days, but again, they don't even really, they can't tell us what it's going to look like when, when they do go to school. Cause they did tell us that every kid in the district is getting an iPad or like a Google tablet or whatever. Everybody's getting a tablet, which makes me think they're, they're trying to set it up where there's going to be no paper and, and it'll be able to have the kids at home and kids in school and everybody will use the tablets or whatever. But then I'm thinking, wait a second, so I'm going to send my kid to school and they're just going to be like at their desk with a tablet, like on the screen at school. So it's on screen at home or on screen at school. I mean, it's so unbelievable. I really don't, I'm sure there's other folks out there. That's why I'm saying this out loud because it's so fresh. I was just like talking to my wife right before I came in here to record and you know, I will say this though, I myself personally have come to a new, I don't know, place. I don't know how long it'll last, but I'm, I'm not freaking out like I was. I'm like the anxiety is given away. It's almost like this surrender has happened. And I will say that it is inspired some by conversations I've had for this show, which you're going to get to hear over the next few weeks, specifically next week. Max Strom will be here, and we're going to talk about emotional healing. And that is what I've been doing, this sort of form of emotional healing, which is not like me to say that. I tend to be very pragmatic and avoid any kind of new age kind of talk. Not that emotional healing is new age, but I don't know. Yoga teachers don't talk a lot about emotions necessarily, but we are definitely going to talk about it next week. And today's talk with Nicola Balin is definitely a form of emotional healing. At least it was for me because Nicola is a podcast listener. She's been listening for a couple of years now. I think at least two, three years almost. She's emailed me once or twice, but recently, like a few weeks ago, she emailed me just You know, every once in a while, someone like you, a listener, will be inspired enough to take a moment to write me a note just to say, hey, I listen to the show every week. She appreciates what I'm doing here, and she wanted to show me a little love. And I have to tell you, it means a lot when someone does that. And very often, I will write back. I try to almost write everybody back. Sometimes I can't, but usually I do. And... She also mentioned in her email that she was in Hong Kong and she talked a little bit about what was happening there with the pandemic. And I thought I'd like to talk to Nicola. I felt like I wanted to see what's it like in Hong Kong. And then when I looked at her bio, I saw actually we had a lot in common. She she lived in America for a while in New York and in San Francisco. So you'll hear we, we touch base on a whole bunch of stuff. But ultimately, I just wanted to... I don't know, touch base with another yoga teacher, someone who listens to the show in Hong Kong and just hear from her. And, you know, doing so really was a form of emotional healing because it showed me like, yes, we are all going through this together, wherever you are. So I really enjoyed connecting with Nicola and I'm excited that you're going to get to hear it today. Real quick before we do, let me mention that this episode is brought to you in support by podcast premium subscribers, Sarah Collin and Jessica Lang. Thank you, Sarah and Jessica and the rest of our podcast premium subscribers. We've been making a point of shouting them out these days because it is through their support that we are able to keep this going the way we are. Not to mention you do get full access to the archives, which is really quite a resource. Of course, it's a choose your rate. And if you can't afford it, just reach out to us. We give free accounts away. But if you listen to the show on the regular and you want to have access to the archives and show your support, becoming a podcast premium subscriber is the way to do it. Also, let me throw in Just another mention of my new J. Brown Yoga Practice Videos 2nd Edition. Some of you know I made these practice videos a few years ago that are about people being able to learn how to practice by themselves at home, and we have upgraded it. 
We made a new version of the 60-minute program that we call the multi-student version that I really am happy with and feeling inspired to share. I think it's a wonderful example of what yoga looks like in all kinds of people. So you can find out about becoming a podcast premium subscriber, the J. Brown Yoga Practice Second Edition, and all the rest of my stuff at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, is there anything else? No, that's good. I will touch base with you on the other side. But let's go ahead and listen to this conversation that I had with Nicola Balin. Hello? Hey, Jay. Hi, Nicola. Is that how you say your name, Nicola? That's how you say it. Well done. Ah, <laughs> uh, cool. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. It's just like really surreal that I'm talking to you right now. <laughs> well, you know, it's fun for me too. And it happens every once in a while where I'm just like wading through some of the emails in my inbox mm-hmm. and I'll come ac- across an email from a podcast listener and I'll think, oh, I want to talk to this person. This will be great. And I'll just shoot off an email. It happens every once in a while. And so it happened with you just the other day. That's the other week. Yeah. Yeah. Like oh, not even a week ago, I think. And that email like tripped me out. I was like, what? <laughs> it's like, well, I can't do this. I'm like, but I must do this. <laughs> so now we're here. This is um, really cool. Yeah, for me too. And, you know, I was just... The reason why was because, you know, I've been having all these conversations with fellow teachers in this teacher's call that I do every week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've just been checking in with people. I've been reaching out to people I know here in the United States mostly and sort of checking in with them on everything that's been going on with, you know, the shutdown and the pandemic. And, And I had someone who was in the group who was in Italy, Mm -hmm. like right when things first started. So we got some like accounts from her, but then I got an email from you and you were in China. You were in Hong Kong, right? Yeah, I'm in Hong Kong. And I hadn't spoken to anybody in China. And frankly, like in that moment when you had reached out to me, there was like all this sort of like, you know, political, whatever, anti-China stuff. I just thought, gosh, I want to talk to somebody (laughs) in China. Yeah, a yoga teacher in China. So that's why I thought, oh, let's hear straight straight from somebody in the grassroots who's there, who can speak to what's going on in a real way that most of the people who listen to this show will understand. Right. Um, yeah. So let me say, like right off the bat, that I'm probably not like the best representation of um, someone from Hong Kong, and. Like a lot of people here, they don't consider themselves quite China right now. <laughs> um, Hong Kong's trying to cling on to its autonomy. It's a special administrative region. So it's like separate from China, even though not completely. It's complicated. I know. Uh, and that's new in the news, right? Where it had quite a bit of autonomy and now some of that is being taken away. Yeah, exactly. So things are a little bit well they were really tense and then they dropped this national security law um on june 30th and that's really scared a lot of people so it actually seems on the surface to be kind of calm and and everything but it's really just i think people are really scared now like there's been activists who have left hong kong um people are like looking to immigrate and it's um yeah, it's a bit unsettling. Um, well, I don't, I don't expect, and I don't think anyone who listened to this will expect you to be a representative of Hong <laughs> Kong as like a, <laughs> a country or a state. But I, I, I'm just curious because you're there. Mm-hmm. And how long have you been there? Mm. So I grew up here. So it is my home. Um, but I'm not Chinese. I'm I'm what you would consider a third culture kid. I don't know if you're familiar with the term. No, what does that mean? So third culture kids is 
um, like in my case, I grew up in a culture that I'm not from that. Uh, and I'm not from the culture that my parents are from either. Uh, so I have this kind of very outsider um, perspective and experience from growing up here. So my dad is from, my dad is from Scotland. He moved here in like the seventies uh, from the UK and my mom is from the Philippines and she did, she came here when she was 12. So she grew up here, but we all have like very different backgrounds and experiences. Um, so I'm what you would consider kind of like an international kid here or was when I was younger. Uh, so I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not one of the locals, you would say. And was that like, a, does that mean it was hard? <laughs> I mean, like you got treated poorly because you're like the outsider kid? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, I went to an international school. So a lot of, um, you know, my friends were f- similar to me. I mean, a lot of the mixed kids were typically half Chinese and half European maybe. Um, so that I didn't really have like uh, many Filipino friends. I had a couple, but majority is, you know, like Chinese to this day, it's like 90 something percent, you know, uh, Chinese here. So the expat community is, is small, but where I live right now, it's actually quite a densely populated expat community. Um, so like where I live, I don't even, you can get around in English just fine. You hardly have to ever, you know, speak Chinese. Hmm. Wow. Well, I guess Hong Kong is pretty, um, international, like metropolitan city, like New York. Yes. And we were, you know, a colony of the UK for a long time. So right. English is one of the main languages. <laughs> Okay, so you grew up in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. How, when did, how long were you there? Did, did you leave? I know you, I saw you, you studied with um, Jasmine Tarkeshi and uh, Laughing Lotus in San Francisco. So at some point you left Hong Kong. When did you leave Hong Kong? I, so I went to NYU. So I left at 18 to go to New York. Ah, me too. What year did you go to NYU in? 1999. Okay, so I went in 1990. Yeah. Did you go to Tisch? Which, which school? No, I so I did studio art, but it was in the school of ed. Okay. Some, yeah, because I think they overlapped it with like the art education. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Okay, so you were in New York in 1999. So was I. Mm. What a trip. And so did you do all four years there? I did. Yeah, I was there till um, the end of 2003. I tried to stay, but my visa uh, ran out, so I came back to Hong Kong. Okay. Did you do New York? Um, I'm sorry, did you do yoga at that time? No, so I didn't do any yoga at that time. I didn't really know anything about yoga. It just wasn't on my radar at all. So I had a best friend who... His roommate was a yoga teacher at that time. So I don't know if that's what was the first introduction I had to yoga, just hearing about it through her. But she used to go tell me about these, like, which now sounds like a kirtan to me. Like, she would tell me about chanting and stuff and singing. And I just thought it was really strange. And, like, you know, what are you getting into? Um, And it wasn't until I came back to Hong Kong that um, I started doing a little bit of yoga. Okay, but when you got back to Hong Kong, did you get like a, jo- a gig, like a job? What, was your, what were you doing with yourself besides starting into some yoga? So the yoga didn't start, yeah, I came back to Hong Kong. I, you know, I just had like a studio art degree, so it felt kind of lost. Like, what am I going to do with this? Yeah, you and my wife both. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> and my parents had spent all this money to send me to New York, and I came back, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, so I actually started working at a bar because I was like, well, that, you know, and then my brother, he was not too fond of the idea of me working at a bar. So he set me up with some of his friends who had like a multi uh, media company. And, you know, I ended up doing some graphics for them. And I just kind of became like this, a graphic designer by, you know, it just happened and I continued going with it. And so that was my job for, uh, quite a while actually before I went into teaching. 
That's some kind of application of your art skills, right? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, the NYU art school was, it wasn't very technical. Like it was more conceptual, I would say. Like you could get really get away with doing anything as long as you had something good to say about it. They weren't really con- concerned about your technique. Mm. So I had taken a computer art class. Sure. But like it was, yeah, mostly all just self-taught. Um, and then from there, I tried freelancing for a while, realized I wasn't very good at working on my own. And then I ended up at a publishing company for a while. And so I was doing art direction for um, a publishing company. Okay. So that was all in Hong Kong, right? That was all in Hong Kong. Yeah. And then somewhere in the middle there, I I started taking some yoga classes for some reason. (laughs) And what was that like? What was the yoga scene like in Hong Kong in the early 2000s or whatever? When, when, when do you remember, do you remember when your first class was? I think my first class was probably in 2005. And I really don't remember what propelled me to go take a class, but it was at this place called Planet Yoga. Oh, I heard about that. It was like huge. That was like a really big center, right? It was pretty big. Yeah. And the, like, I think all the teachers were Indian from my memory. And I remember going in and, you know, they had like the platform for the teachers, like raised mm-hmm. platform where they taught from. Right. <laughs> and I just remember going in and the teacher giving me like a uh, assessment card at the end of the class. <laughs> like, I don't remember what the things were on the assessment card, but like you did good at this, you were fair at this, you need improvement here. <laughs> oh, like an evaluation. Like yeah, like an evaluation. evaluation. And I just remember taking that class and, and um, I just remember triangle being so painful and being like, Oh, because I was quite fit. I was doing a bunch of stuff. And then we did like a side plank and I like my arm buckled and I fell. <laughs> and I just remember all these students kind of like bickering. I mean, I'd be, you know, like laughing in the background. And like then, laughing at you for falling? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was like, come this on. Isn't, this isn't cool. <laughs> no, it's definitely not cool. Um, so it, was, it, was, it was a bit of a scene. It was becoming a yeah. It was definitely becoming a scene, um, and I don't, I don't, I don't think I went there for that long. Um, and I ended up going to Pure, and I'm sure you've heard of Pure. Oh, I think that's actually the one I was thinking of. Pure yeah. is like the mega one. They had one in New York too. Yes, yeah. So Pure is is really big, and so I started going to Pure at some point, and that's where I I really started to fall in love with yoga. I found some teachers that I really liked and, you know, that was definitely a scene. And it was, I mean, if I understand from what I've heard of that, they basically had like everything, like every type of yoga under the sun. Yeah. And it's still, I mean, they've exploded. They, I don't even know how many centers they have. I mean, obviously they're just, they're struggling right now as um, everybody is. And you can imagine rents in Hong Kong are, are ridiculous and, and their spaces are, huge yes gargantuan (laughs) yeah and you've got you know you have even when I was taking classes there you'd have to you know for like after work class you'd have to book in like call and book in the morning or whenever the lines opened up and you know you'd be on a waiting list and you'd have to go and you have to like wait and see if you could get into the class yeah I remember it was like that it was like that at Jiva Mukti at one point when like some celebs started coming yeah. But I, I, from what I've heard, like in a certain ways, Hong Kong is still a place on the planet. At least it was before everything happened mm-hmm. where it was still kind of booming. Yeah. And I know like a lot of yoga teachers on the international circuit mm-hmm. would started making Hong Kong a regular stop because that was a place you could go and get whatever 60 to a hundred people to show up yeah. to a workshop where there's not a lot of places in the world where that's still true, you know, like over time stuff gets saturated and whatnot. Even yeah. in New York city, that doesn't happen like it used to so much anymore, especially mm-hmm. again, now everything shut down, but yeah. Hong Kong was still pretty booming at the it end of last is. year. Yeah. It still is. I was at the Asian yoga conference last summer and it was, it was busy, mm-hmm. really busy. All right. So you're doing graphic design work. And mm-hmm. going to classes at Pure, mm-hmm. what were the classes that you like? What were you, what did you gravitate to originally? Um, like vinyasa classes, hot vinyasa classes. If I, you know, if I didn't, you know, if I wasn't drenched at the end of the class, I was like, 
give me my money back. You know, <laughs> that wasn't what I wanted. You know, <laughs> so it was all very intense. It's um, like Hong Kong's very much, especially when you're young and working. It's it's like a work hard, party hard, exercise hard. Like everything is so intense. Mm. So even the yoga was like intense, and I would like go to yoga either at my lunch break or go after work, and then go out after. You know, so it's just like fitting it in and getting everything, like ticking all the boxes. Right. <laughs> Me too. New York was like that too. So fast paced. Yeah. And I remember, I remember having a conversation with someone about that, about how, yeah, life is so fast and hard. So my yoga has to be that way too, to like train me to be better at it or whatever. Yeah. And I think that's what sense. people wanted. They felt like if they weren't sweating, working hard, straining like they weren't learning something they weren't getting somewhere if you were just going to go in somewhere and sit sit around you know like what would be the point in that i know it's so ironic though because now i just feel like life's already so hard i don't want my yoga to be more hard <laughs> exactly <laughs> I need my yoga to be making my life less hard not stacking exactly. it on you know yeah, absolutely. I think it's wow. it's changed. It's it's still like that, but there's definitely more options now. Like there's so much um, softer practices available, and all the, I think even all the big studios too are offering like more of a range of things that right. people are responding to. But are you? Do you end up being real regular? Do you go all the time? Yeah, you know, I, I've become one of those people who if I don't go for one day, I, I, I freak out. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I was just oh, saying, no. I, go, I, I remember going to like more than one class a day. Sometimes. Yeah, I, yeah, I remember. I, I just had this one teacher who I adored, like, I was just like obsessed with her. And I went to one class, and then she was teaching another class. And like, she walks into the second class, and I'm sitting there in like the f- middle of the front row, like, ready to take her second class. And she was just like, oh, like, you again. <laughs> like, here I am. I know, but in a way, I don't know, as a teacher now, somebody does that, it's very significant. I'm very aware if someone's choosing to come to my class Mm. on a regular like that, Mm -hmm. what that means, because like you, I did that also. (laughs) (laughs) It means stuff, right? Because it was clearly serving some kind of role or some kind of important purpose, whether you were aware of what it was or or not. Yeah, no, she was quite a significant um, part of the the journey, I have to say. You know, like I remember even years later, you know, writing to her and just thanking her. Like, you know, she left that imprint. And at one point when I was living in San Francisco, she came to, maybe it was like a yoga conference there, but she was doing a community class and I saw her name and I was like, oh my God, she's here. And I like, you know, I had to go, I had to go, I had to go take her class and see her and yeah. That first teacher who really like gives you the, the initial key, you know, like the initial doorway mm-hmm. They're they're special. Yeah, they really are. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Me too. Kachi Ananda. She's been on the show before. She was that for me in, in certain ways. She was like my original person who inspired me to want to practice regular, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, And mostly because I, it was about, I mean, to some degree it was about her, but she was the kind of teacher who did not put herself up above others in any way. Mm-hmm. And she always, she always taught from personal experiences. Like instead of talking about the Gita, she would talk about the fight she had with her boyfriend or whatever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that, yeah, yeah, that, that was just super appealing to me and kind of made it accessible. Yeah. Wendy was like a, like a, a surfer as well. So she would use a lot of her surfing stories to kind of nice. Yeah. And she was, she was just so cool. You know, <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. I'm a gay, just like Wendy. But, well, but isn't that it? What I think it was for me is that Kachi had some qualities as a person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was like intimate and like communicative and present in a way that other people in my life were not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, I wanted whatever that, what, whatever I saw that I liked about her as a person. I was like, I want some of that. <laughs> how yeah. do I be more, how do I be more like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I feel yeah. like this, you know, the teaching journey has been a lot about trying to find that authenticity, you know, like just being real, being who you are. 
Isn't that true? Well, when does that start to happen for you? So you're going all the time, you're graphic designing, and okay. then when do you think, oh, maybe I should do teacher training or start teaching or something like that? Um, I don't remember if I was thinking about it then. I, I remember Wendy did like, she, she was like a, a Baptiste student. So she did this like 40 day thing, like, like a Baptiste thing. And so I did that with her and, you know, it was like deepening the practice, whatever. Um, and then, so, so my husband now, he, he, I met him at, in NYU and we were kind of on and off for a long time, but at some point we decided, all right, you know, like, let's just do this and get married. And so in 2008, I got married and that's when I, I went back to New York. Actually in 2009, I went back to New York. We, we did like a backpacking honeymoon for a few months. Hmm. And so I go back to New York in 2009 and I'd been back a couple times visiting him. And I think that's when I first kind of popped into Laughing Lotus in New York. Mm -hmm. um, I remember it had like drape fabric and like <laughs> it was all in like purples and pinks and yeah, stuff, right? A lot of purples and pinks. And you have to understand, <laughs> yeah. like I'm coming from pure in Hong Kong where it's like very slick, like everything is, you know, very zen and you know, the mats are laid out, you come in, you go to the mat and then you leave, you know, the cleaners come and they take the mats away. And it's all very posh. And then I walk into the Laughing Lotus in New York and like, it's like the four floorboards are creaky and there's paintings all over the wall. And I think my first reaction was like, oh, this is too like hippy dippy for me. <laughs> like this is a little out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I keep going back. And then when I moved to New York, I went there um, quite regularly. And I, I would go to yoga to the people in St. Mark's. Oh, wow. You know, I don't know if you heard about that, but there's been like all kinds of stuff about that yoga to the people scandals about oh, people really? coming out about all the like abusive behavior that was oh, going no. on around there. I know there's like some big Instagram. Oh, no campaign anyways i don't know i just i was just reading up on that the other day so you <sighs> yeah i you know nothing surprises me anymore um. <laughs> oh man well interesting though so you were going to yoga to the people also but you were i'm sorry where else were you? i'm sorry i just lost my train of thought where were you going again other I was than going yoga to, to laughing lotus I was laughing going to lotus, yoga right. to the people yeah but, you know because i was when i moved there like i couldn't work i was on a i was i had applied for my green card and so I couldn't, so I didn't have that much money. <laughs> like yoga to the people was like the, yeah. you know, you, you could go donation. on the cheap. Yeah. yeah. You could go on the cheap if you wanted, if you needed to. And also I was thinking about laughing Lotus, like they had their own vibe, you know, Dana, she was such a, a character and that yeah. place certainly, I know a lot of folks who came out of that center and mm -hmm. had great experiences there. Yeah, I think it slowly kind of like grew on me. Like, I think I primarily went there because it was like the closest thing to me. Like we were living in like, near meatpacking district. And so I could walk mm. over to Laughing Lotus. But then we moved to, so we moved to San Francisco. We were in, in New York for like six months, a little bit more. And then mm. we moved to San Francisco and then... Okay. Well, you know, first of all, let's just mention, you know, that this, the Laughing Lotus Center in New York has closed down. I didn't know that, but I was, yeah. I like stuff did come into my radar this yeah. past week. I just yeah. saw a note from Dana the other day and I guess she's in, she's in New Orleans now. The yeah. Center in New Orleans, but the New York Center is closed down, which is crazy because all of those New York standards, the Laughing Lotus and Jiva Mukti, they're, they're gone. Know. I know. It's crazy. That is crazy. Crazy. Well, all right. So you went to San Francisco. Where were you in San Francisco? So first two years we were there, we were in San Francisco. We were like in the city. Although back then we used to laugh that people would call San Francisco the city. They're like, this is in a city. <laughs> Not the same. I mean, I lived in Bernal Heights for about six oh, months. Yeah. That's nice. In, in like 1994. Okay. But like you, I was coming from New York and mm -hmm. it didn't feel like a city to me. I remember I would have to take a bus because I didn't have any transportation. So yeah, I would me wait, neither. I would, I would wait 45 minutes for a bus <laughs> to pick me up 
to take me 15 minutes to work. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I just felt like yes. this city is holding me back. It's not fast <laughs> enough. It wasn't like New York. It didn't have the pace of like no, New York, you know? No. Yeah. yeah. I, did, I didn't, you know, I, I've never had to drive before living in Hong Kong, living in New York. So I didn't, I couldn't drive. And I was like, you know, at the mercy of the buses, which were just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So even going yeah. out to Laughing Lotus was like quite a trek to get there. Mm-hmm. But I was going there um, and I was doing like some hot yoga. Like, like I was doing the hot as well with yoga to the people. Mm-hmm. And then I was doing some hot stuff in uh, San Francisco as well. And then at some point, I guess, you know, I saw that they were offering a training and I finally felt like, Hmm. You know, is now the time I was still unemployed. Like I, you know, it was a really tough year. Moving to San Francisco was a really tough year. My husband was a tech consultant at the time. And so he would travel during the week from Monday to Fridays. And so I was essentially like alone in San Francisco, you know, not really being able to get around that easily, not knowing uh, that many people. And so I just kind of felt like it was time to do like it was just the right time. And so I, I applied and. That actually does sound like a perfect time. It's like this inflection point. You've got solitude. Mm-hmm. You don't have all these identifiers around you. Cause you're in a new place where you don't have like established, you know, yeah. who you are. It's like when you travel mm-hmm. and you, you go to a place you've never been, there's nothing there mm-hmm. that was like your external identifiers. So the, all that's left is what's inside you in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it felt like just the right time. And like, I think I was starting to work again. I was at this point, I probably, yeah, I think I already had my green card. And so I was starting to work and doing more graphic design, but I was like on a contract worker and the program was every weekend and it just fit in nicely and um, yeah, I had a really, really good time there. I really loved uh, the San Francisco Center. Was that with Jasmine? So that was with Jasmine and Keith, Keith Borden, who's not there anymore. He's in Madison, I want to say now. But yeah, it was mm-hmm. a, a really great training. Like I like really went deep. There was a, like, you know, there, like, the thing I love about Laughing Lotus is there's so much heart and soul and spirit into it. And even though that's not where I kind of started from, I, I still, you know, I quickly come, came to realize this is what really spoke to me. Mm, well, you probably could do a bunch of poses by then. I mean, <laughs> enough, but you know, I feel like I've never been, you know, I've never taken it. I, I would never consider myself like a traditional, like um, advanced mm. practitioner, you know? Mm. That's for the best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I still, you know, I'm still kind of you know, having to let that go, even though I don't, you know, want it. There's still times where that comes up like, oh, I should, you know, up my asana game. I should practice mm. this. And, do, and then I'm like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> I, I think we all want to, we all need to up our contemplative game. Yeah. Let's not worry about the asana so much. No. Although again, I don't, I don't, I love asana practice. I think it's wonderful, mm-hmm. but I just think there was such an overemphasis on it for so long. Yeah. And maybe still right. to this day in a lot of places mm-hmm. where like the accomplishment of the forms is what makes you advanced. Mm-hmm. And that yeah. just, that's, yeah. For most people who were who've worked hard to be able to do, you know, big flashy forms, mm-hmm. at some point they go, ah, oh, well, I don't know if it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, no, <I'm- laughs> so if it's just going to be that, if it's not going to encompass more something else, right? Then I think it's a very hollow pursuit. Yeah, because then what? What next? You you get the pose, and then and then what? Mm. You know, and in Asia, I feel like there's something in the kind of the Asian mentality where there's got to be sort of like this barometer of success and achievement, you know, like you have to go from, you know, climb the steps to get somewhere. So I think it's been like even the yoga conference, you know, last month, like so many of the things is, you know, like crazy backbending and like trying to do all these crazy poses. So many of the workshops 
<laughs> well, wait, let's get back to Asia. So you're, you're in San Francisco now. Yes. You're, you do your teacher training at Laughing Lotus in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. By the time you're done with the training, are, do you start teaching right away? Um, I was still working and it was, my workload was getting heavier and I was, uh, I, was t- I think I was working almost like five days a week. So what ended up happening was I remember rent, I rented out a space in like, um, what neighborhood was it? I'm blanking out. But I just rented out this like, you know, multi-purpose space and I was just offering something once a one evening a week but then what ended up happening so I graduated in May and then I got pregnant at the end of the summer mm-hmm. so I was working full-time newly pregnant trying to you know teach these yoga classes hmm. and at some point I was like I you know I gotta drop something I can't do yeah, yeah that that baby was enough yoga for <laughs> that's all yoga you'll ever do <laughs> Yeah, so really, I have to blame my children for derailing me. <laughs> no, no, they didn't derail you. They set me on the higher path. I shouldn't say that. I mean, maybe you feel that way. I know my, my wife and I have had those conversations because I have two children, 10 and mm-hmm. 5. Mm. And so the 5-year-old is just now getting to the place where she's getting parts of potentially a parts of her life back that she sacrificed when she started to have children, like mm. her studio practice, my wife's an artist and she's made things over the years, but never really had like a studio. So mm. in any case, that's been something we've been talking a lot about. What you're describing is this, um, there's sacrifices that frankly women make that men don't, I didn't have to make the same sacrifice that she had to make. Yeah, Definitely. Yeah, I just remember being pregnant and kind of feeling like, you know, I'm just going to be one of those pregnant ladies that, you know, going all the way (laughs) until I have my baby and I'm not going to take any prenatal classes. I'm just going to keep going. And then when I hit like seven months pregnant, my belly is just like too in the way. Like I can't (laughs) just do everything. And finally I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to go and do some prenatal yoga. And so I go to Jane Austen in yoga tree Mm. and she's this amazing, amazing um, prenatal and postnatal teacher. And I fall in love with the prenatal practice. And I think ever since then, that's been the softening of my own practice Mm. and just that journey through like, you know, like physically not being able to do the things like that I used to do. That's very interesting. That's interesting to me because I've always felt like when I had my center, I always had a prenatal program the entire 10 years I had the center, even when I didn't necessarily make any money off of it. Mm -hmm. And the reason was, is I felt like at the time, particularly back when, you know, there was like really heavy emphasis on different styles of yoga. Prenatal always felt very authentic to me Mm -hmm. because it was so directly tied to a particular life situation. Mm -hmm. Like being pregnant is such an encapsulated life situation. Mm -hmm. And the yoga was specifically geared towards someone in that situation. Mm -hmm. And so much about sharing among the women and resources and like support. Yeah. Especially for like new moms, like first pregnancies like it was such um I didn't I didn't even realize at the time that that's what I was looking for and that's what I wanted but then to be in that space and Jane is like you know she's super knowledgeable um if you are hearing this message then you're listening to the free version of Jay Brown Yoga Talks to hear the rest of our conversation please subscribe to podcast premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium